All right, Chelsea fans, welcome back to another episode of the London Is Blue podcast. So here's host Brandon, not my mom's basement. We're joined by Nick and Dan, my co-host. Gentlemen, another week, another remote location. Nobody can track me. You don't know where I am, but I am in another basement. No, no, no. <laughs> if, you've, if you've watched anyone on TikTok recently, you know they can and they will find you just by some of the information you've put out there. Maybe no not thanks. even you. Maybe information your wife has put out there or your wife's friends oh, have put out there. Oh, boy. And your wife is a, a frequent poster, my guy. There's there's no doubt about it. You'd, you'd be found pretty quick. Yeah. The, geo, I, the geolocation would be tough. Yeah. Uh, I think her Instagram would be a giveaway. I wonder if she's still private. Doesn't matter. We're here to chat Chelsea <laughs> because... Text furiously. We are back. <laughs> Chelsea are back. New month, new number. Who dis? Forget all the problems. The X is left behind. We are starting a new life, gentlemen. We have packed the bags and moved on. <laughs> and <Good>. We are. <laughs> Did we get divorced? Did we get kicked out of the house? Well, what it happened? Turns out West Ish London is actually more favorable for Chelsea mm. than proper West London. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So we, we learned that through the Fulham match. We're going to be covering that one. As you can tell, vibes are good uh, as Fulham lose the battle for SW6. So let's jump into it. Dan, with that patented, always imitated, never improved upon three-word match review. Look, they were they were good today. Congratulations to everyone involved, but not everybody can get make it into the, the pod version of it. But Pablo, infinite athletes undefeated. Very true for both the men are. and women's team. It's Steven with the sponsorless sponsorless shirt cursed with a prove me wrong. Might be very true. Kevin with the Chelsea's lucky sevens, highlighting the fact that every single player in Chelsea's starting lineup was a 7-0 or higher on sofa score. Gemma with the captain Connor Gallagher. Anox with Broya's back boys. Def Jux Daddy with the Craven Cottage Cheesed. Mm. clip show with the cottage rating party and then tk lot with the eat shitty dominoes or eat shit dominoes chelsea, depends on how you want to read it chelsea scenes put that out there i threw it in the whatsapp as well <clears throat> something about like keep ordering or you know delivering them up that was good to see after uk dominoes was taking the piss as they might say over there uh nick what about you there's a lot of smiling going on it's a little uncomfortable for dan and i it's just you know, th these guys are like little brother, so it's a little older sibling vibes is what I went with for the three-word match review. We went in there, gave him a noogie, and left. It was great. Especially with that second goal, the shenanigans. I said London is blue-ish. We're not there yet, but we're working on it, especially after last season. It, it was tough. So it was tough. Dan, what about you? Well, I went with Fulham Ghost Hosts because they were basically apparitions on the field it's like who showed up who showed up to play they didn't they didn't show up to play a football game like pac-man out there yeah gobble them up all right well obviously we always say this but we appreciate all of you listeners out there if you want to help us five star review apple Podcasts and spotify Podcasts. uh subscribe on youtube road to 30k and lastly but not leastly if you want to be in the discord join through patreon an amazing community there uh, only a few bucks a month will get you access. But most importantly, Nick, we need help with our egos, right? People mm. apparently love us. You know us, me. <laughs> and we we need it vindicated. Yeah, look, Football Content Awards, we're out there, okay? We have uh, the, the ceremonies being held at Anfield. This is, this is one of my later pitches to you guys. Ceremonies being held at Anfield. Chelsea, historically, done pretty well at Anfield. We've went in there and surprised a couple of Liverpool fans from time to time, uh, notably the Jose Mourinho badge, the 2-0. Oh, do you remember? That oh, was great. Uh, we should do that again by the London is Blue podcast winning the Football Content Award for Best Premier League Podcast. Please go vote in the on the website. If you go to any of our social feeds, we put the link there. Or go to the Football Content Awards Instagram page, at London Blue Pod in the comments counts as a vote. Uh, we should be flooding the zone here. Lots of votes. We should go in there, confidently walk up in the middle of enemy territory and claim an award that, you know, we think we do a pretty good job and we should win. And it's bigger than just us, Dan. It's literally Chelsea versus other teams in this. Arsenal, Liverpool, ugh, blah. Spurs. I mean, come on. Like, you just don't want that to be something that's on the footnotes of history that like a Chelsea podcast could have won this award. And because you 
didn't take just a few moments to participate, we didn't get it across the line. Every vote count. Every vote matters. It's Look, it's not November. It's not next year in the U.S. presidential elections. We just need a vote now for the Football Content Awards for London's Blue Podcast. Links in the description and show notes. All right. And make sure to go check out Blue Royalty. Women's season has kicked off with uh, a thrilling victory at the bridge. Uh, Harkening back, Blue Royalty's up and running in full. So check it out. A lot of Chelsea content, as we promised. So anyways, let's jump into it. It was the Fulham match review this past Monday, the 2nd of October. Hate a Monday kickoff. Uh, But it was in the Premier League at Craven Cottage. And in case you missed it, Fulham nil, Chelsea 2. Goals coming from Mikhailo Mudrik in the 18th minute. Chef's kiss assist from Levi Cole. But can I get oh, yeah. a mention for the second assist? Mm-hmm. The Caicedo baits the attacker, floats him into space, and Levi does the rest. It was fantastic. And then Broya, less than a minute later, uh, gets a deflection tap in for the go-ahead uh, off Tim Ream. Cole, Cole Palmer doing some excellent baiting there in defense, just kind of feints a move and then stays where he is. The pass goes right to him. He slots it in. Of course, bro, it's a little bit fortunate, but uh, just some incredible kind of zone defending if you're an NBA fan there, just kind of managing your zones between players from Cole Palmer. Excellently done. Turns out if you can get uh, defenders running at their goal, it creates some issues. So let's go ahead and kick it over to the Fist Stand App, the only official app from Chelsea FC. Thank you to them for letting us use the highlights. Download if you haven't. Here we go. All right. That was fun, Dan. But we should probably break down who Maurizio Pochettino head gaffer chose for this one. Well, it was Bob Sanchez back between the sticks. It was Mark Kukurea as a right back. He was close to a Robert today, Dan. He was very close to a Robert there in the second half. Axel Dissasi and Thiago Silva as your center back pairing with Levi, not a left back, Colwell as the rest of your defense. You had Connor Gallagher playing as the most furthest forward individual of our midfield, which also comprised of Moises Caicedo and Enzo Fernandez. And then it was Armando Broya up top with Mikhailo Mudrik and Cole Palmer on the wings. Look, a lot of substitutes. He used them all. Yeah, Matson, Raheem Sterling, Leslie Oguchukwu, Nani Matueke, and Alex Matos coming in at the very end for a debut on the day before his birthday. So what a little bit of an early treat from Riso Pochettino for young Alex and a little bit of applause and well done for him. Yeah, it's a little bit tough because uh, in the PL2, uh, I think it was the PL2, the dev squad played Spurs at the identical same time. So it's like, it's tough that some of these players have to miss out. But I mean, that's just the the gist of it. You know, you got to support the first team, especially with all of uh, the injuries. But that was... Not the result we wanted there. Uh, Some of the top line stats, Chelsea amassed a 1.73 XG. Fulham did get over the one mark with 1.08. We actually only had 44% possession. That will be one of my talking points later. Uh, 11 shots, only four on target, six off, one blocked. We only had one corner kick. All match, just the one. Uh, Fulham had eight. Four offsides, I guess that says we're trying. 12 fouls to their 15, but four cautions for Chelsea to Dumb. Fulham's one. And it was Dumb. for a karate chop at the back of Thiago Silva. Or Vinicius, that crazy, crazy nonsense. Uh, we did have four big chances, but hear me out. Normally, Dan, I, I follow this up with and missed them all. We only missed half of them. Two went in. What a delight. Look, it's a uh, it's a nice place to be when your chances go in, when your big chances go in. It's great, great, great day. Yeah, we had- on a serious note, really quick uh, on the refereeing. There's a lot of talk of the refereeing right now because of what happened during the Liverpool Spurs game on Saturday and, and a lot of errors on Sunday. I I don't think this official had necessarily a bad overall day. I thought he was pretty consistent and was hesitant to sh- you know do the descent card too much and stuff like that. If someone physically punches another player, like that's an automatic red card, man. I like, I don't care. Like the, the commentary was really, really nonchalant about that. Like, Oh, we, you know, I don't know if there's enough in there. If I physically do that to you in public, that's an assault charge. Like, 
I don't understand how it's possible that the VAR would look at that and not determine that that's a red card offense. There is no reason for his arm to be crashing down upon the neck and, and shoulders of Tiago Silva other than he meant to do it. So, again, like, we're not Liverpool, so the outrage isn't going to be there by the general public, but fuck me, this is terrible. Well, you, you've seen now Liverpool have requested the audio clips from the communication between the officials at the match to understand what's going on. They've pushed for an inquest. I've seen Liverpool supporters highlighting this as another example and highlighting that, look, it's not just Liverpool being upset about it now. Like the, the inquest, there's enough starting to bubble here to the surface that they will be, I think Brandon in short order, have an answer for a lot more than just one team's on the day incident that it's a cacophony of concerns. Yeah, you're not baiting me with this topic today. I've had my my uh, rants and things, but you're not wrong. The bar is so low, Nick, that you're like, you know what? Minus the karate chop, you're like, it was actually a decent day out, even though we got booked to high heavens. Think about the <laughs> phrase that you just said, minus the karate chop, it Correct. was a pretty good day out. What a Correct. fucking phrase that is. It's insane where we're at. Uh, rally all the troops of Premier League fans and let's get this changed. It is a debacle. You've heard me uh, say it before. I said it on Twitter. Get away from the British refereeing bias. It's failing. Uh, anyways, one random stat from at Opta Joe says 82. Chelsea had failed to score with any of their previous 47 attempts on the goal in the Premier League before Mikhailo Mudrik's opener against Fulham. While there were just 82 seconds between his strike and Armando Broyes' buses. And then the XG philosophy cleverly tweeting that Chelsea are the only Premier League team to have won every game on XG this season in all competitions. That shit sounds like Potterball. If we think about it, that was what Graham Potter was known for. Now we got to break the duck with Pochettino as well. Uh, any end, end pet shit house moment of the match? I mean, obviously we talked about the karate chop and one Brazilian attacking another, but uh, what else? I, I would say, like, I don't know if this is the, the shit house moment of the match for me, but I, I really, I think there were moments, especially in the first half, uh, where Connor Gallagher threw in a bit of a, an extra j because that's what a captain is supposed to do in moments. Like there, there was a lot of, I think it was Pereira. Um, I forget who number eight, who he fouled quite a bit in this game because he was their only really working midfielder. Um, and there was one where he got Connor and then very next play down, Connor went and got him back. And I think Lee Dixon was even commenting on it. Like, I wonder if this is going to continue the rest of the match. And then, Thankfully, Connor moved on to fouling other players, which I thought was a very smart move uh, as to not get booked for the kind of immediate kind of back and forth. So, you know, perhaps the uh, the young folks are, are learning their dark arts in, in little uh, little fits and starts, which I like. Yeah. Connor was lined up against Pereira. He's 18, but same idea as a running around 18. Yes. Sorry. All right, well, let's go ahead and take our first ad break. When we get back, jumping into what it's like to score a goal. That's right, a real goal, not an XG one. Thank you to the sponsors, and we'll be right back. <laughs> Scoring a goal? Tired. Scoring two goals? Wired. Presented by C4 Energy Drink. Right, Dan? Yeah, you know, we, we just hit some pre-workout real hard before this match, which is why the goals happened before the 20th minute, and then the productivity greatly decrease into the later as the match continued to evolve but no this was great this was great to go and win a game go and win a game with two goals go to feel pretty good about the game within the first 20 minutes because as scary or as much as the old adage is that the two goal lead is the most dangerous lead in all of football statistically it doesn't pan out that way a two goal lead is generally very hard to overcome I mean, I guess maybe unless you're Chelsea, Nick. Yeah, I mean, we, we've spoken at length about this this year, but you know, we're tied, I think, for second defensively in the Premier League in terms of goals given up. Um, now, has it been, you know, the 2004-2005 Chelsea defense? No, of course not. But, like, clearly de the defense is good enough to keep us in games. The attack needs to pick up their their weight and, and team and, and carry it forward. And, 
you know, I think from the first moment of this game, the attacking play, the passing was extra crisp. You know, I, I, what I loved about the attack today, Brandon, was that the, the there were players uh, taking turns, whether it was Mudrick, Palmer, or Broya, taking turn dropping deep, and then one of Enzo or Gallagher would replace them, right? And it would keep this kind of swirling motion and attack going so that, you know, none of uh, the Fulham defense could really get settled. They were always having to track a man, and that man was different depending on, on the offensive play. This was a much more competent um, offensive display for me than we've had all season. Um, you know, not the most amount of total shots. I'd like to see that number go up and certainly the shots on target go up. But some of the passing movements were phenomenal. Like there was in one in the second half, I think it was right before Broya went off, where, you know, he makes a great run in the box, cuts it across. And if Mudrick is there on, on the back post like he should be instead of trying to crowd out where Gallagher is, then we have a goal because it's easy to happen, right? So the the movement was the really important part of, of analyzing the attack for me today. Obviously, the goals are fantastic. Obviously, I'm very happy for both Broya and Mudra to get off the schneid, right, and to, to, to really feel like they are, you know, attacking components of, of this team. But the movement, I thought, was great, and, and that was fueled through Gallagher and Palmer, who were excellent today. Palmer's well-earned. You guys talked about it, right? Like, he's earned the minutes. He got in today and was a catalyst. Something we've been missing. Enzo was playing too far up. He finally got to sit back next to his new bromigo, Moises Caicedo. Uh, Connor, John Terry was even tweeting about how much Connor provides in the attack. What? We're using bro. Is this 2007? It's Espanol. Bromigo. Well, look, he, he said it because of the goal celebration, which the goal That's celebration between Enzo and Caicedo, it's a phenomenal. Delight. Seeing each other, locking eyes, the massive smile, the arms wide open, the jump in hug. Like, come on. The fact that didn't that didn't get like a Monday Night Football breakdown from Carragher and Lampard and others, really disappointed. Shocking state of commentary to not give that the full due. Can we get the creed? Can we get arms wide open playing while no. they hug? I think. Wow, you were making fun of his bromigo. Now you're going into creed, creed is wide, arms wide open. <laughs> creed is back, so baby. So <laughs> I'd like to reclaim my time uh, <laughs> because uh, Cole Palmer, absolutely, like in, in um, absolute catalyst in this one. We needed it. Uh, he was able to find pockets of space. Uh, he's a, a direct runner, not afraid to pull the trigger. Didn't get it himself today. Um, but he has earned these minutes coming in from the bench. I bet he's just missing some fitness, and now he's he's up to to par and going. Caicedo looks way more sharp, Enzo as well, which is which is good. But guys, there's been a lot of talk about Mudrik this week, especially this week, right? Poch had some quotes about him talking about how it's not so easy because he works so hard. Some players being anonymously quoted that they've literally never been around a player who works as hard as Mudrik. The problem is almost, is it is it become inefficient, right? Is he working too much to where the end product's not there? Lampard had some great compliments about how he's not only fast, but he's technical. Really, really good, I think, um, from him today. If we focus in on that goal, the run, the, the poise he had to finish, he brought it down off his chest. I can't remember if he took a touch before he, he slotted home low, but to be under the scrutiny that he's been so far in this squad, being labeled a flop, being labeled, you know, is, is uh, you know, are Arsenal fans laughing that, that they didn't go for him and they picked up the Brighton guy instead? Vindicated today. No, it's not oh, enough, yeah. right? But... It is a step, and I see the mentality warrior in him, and it was such a great run. It was a phenomenal ball by Levi, but the finish was excellent, and I'm excited to see that from him. I'm so, so happy from him. Look, he is, he's been under the cosh, right? You know, um, kind of Torres vibes, pay a bunch of money, struggles to score, struggles to really make an impact in a lot of different ways. And I think we all remember that moment against West Ham when, you know, Torres scored probably the worst looking goal of his whole career, but it went over the line and into the net. 
and it was pouring rain and everyone dog piled on him and it looked like the weight of the world was off of his shoulders. This, we don't know what it's going to do for him yet, right? And I don't want to like over promise and, and, and all that sort of stuff, but sometimes you just need one, Dan. Sometimes you just need one and, and the pressure isn't as intense and your focus might be a little clearer and maybe that leads to more. Yeah, I mean, I think the interesting thing, right, he's running in to a more central position versus floating out to the left. So I think that is something that we've seen him do a fair amount where he'll try to either run to the touchline or he'll or the end line and he'll try to kind of get into a tighter position, maybe lay the ball off to somebody else. So this was him being more assertive in the run, making a run with the mind or the thought to go after a goal. He actually floated between center backs. Like typically he's looked to maybe take on whether it's it's the right back or one of the center backs, like one on one, try to make something happen. So this was more about exploiting where there was available space and then took it from the weak foot. Right. So I think three things that he doesn't always do that we had a chance to see as he built up to this goal. And you know, I think to the point we commented, like the delivery from Cola was absolutely insane. Like Epic. really, really great in great element there. I mean, the goal had a very high XG, it was 0.51. So like this, this is the type of goal that's good, should get scored. And he just slots it directly through Leno and gets the goal. I mean, I, this is great. This is a great element for him. You don't want to set the expectation too high about what comes next, but this is what we discussed is that if you could get him opportunities, you can get him time, you get him an opportunity to replicate actions over and over again so he could build confidence build comfort and then start to see any of this attacking prowess that he's had previously you would feel very very confident pochettino talked about that after the match as well gave compliments to mudrick gave compliments to, to broya mentioned that the he felt something in his quad which is why he was taken off for Matson later in the match or at halftime. But like this ultimately was a really good half an outing for him. Hopefully he's able to be involved and start in our match of the weekend. The good news, keep the good vibes going. Um, because it sounds like Mudrik, he's okay. Felt something in his quad. So the precautionary on his part, his uh, counterpart, Armando Broya, he was forced into this match. You know, I, I complained a little bit about it, right? Uh, Jackson picking up a lot of cautions early on gets a suspension. I mean, this is almost as early of a suspension as you could serve in the Premier League for cautions, right? So Nico Jackson's out. We were a little bit worried about Broya's fitness more than anything. I don't think anyone's worried about Broya playing. I don't think anyone's worried about Broya scoring goals. It's, hey, what about the fitness? Are we okay here? Uh, got uh, a good amount of time, and they withdrew him again as precautionary, which is smart, and he gets his goal, right? Hard work gets that goal. Smart running gets that goal. Uh, obviously, Cole Palmer had a lot to do twisting up uh, Tim Ream, which helped create it. You have to buy a ticket if you want to ride the ride, and Broya absolutely gritted it as long as he was in, and I'm excited. Like, I was shocked that he played as long as he did. I thought he might come off after half because, I mean, to not play in the Premier League, to not play at all and then have to be in the Premier League and start a match, even though Fulham were lethargic and not necessarily there, you know, this wasn't a high-intensity game by any means um, compared to what we've seen. He he did as well as anyone could have expected, I, I think. And I like that I, I, maybe I'm traditional – in this way, I like that he's a big body. I like that he can hold up play a little bit easier than maybe Jackson can. Not saying that Jackson doesn't have a place in that attack, but you know, because I, I, I did like what I saw out of, of, of Jackson um, this the summer tour and, and stuff like that. But there's just something about you know, especially with his pace, Dan, when he's running at defenders. I think Sam. Uh, tweeted something that it's like, you know, defenders better hope they're not wearing white shorts when he's doing that. Like, that's, you know, classic Samism, if you will. But it, there's something about his his running style and the way that he can do He He just has something, some quality to me that I just love. 
Well, NBC Sports were talking to him after the match, letting him watch back the goal and talked about how he just he knew when Palmer made the interception that he was just going to find a ball to play him through. And it was up to him to, as he said, get on the bike and just make it there so that he could get himself the opportunity. Look, Tim, Tim Ream did not do a great job uh, in the in in any aspect of that phase in that play that there was there was no good movement from Tim Ream uh, in, in that scenario so he did get a little exposed but in general show up take a shot see what happens and Broya sets us in a path where this game felt pretty secure before the 20th minute which is not something the Chelsea men's team have made us feel in quite some time. It, you know, like the GIF, it's been 84 years. It almost feels like that at times. And the last thing I would say is that Colwell at the very end of the match was captured on some of the ending video leading out of the broadcast saying that he, you know, you know talking about Broya, he's back, he's fucking back. And like that is a really good thing if you can say, hey, we've got Broya, we've got Jackson, Pochettino's options. He can figure out how to get both of these guys firing we're in a really good spot, but again, it is early days still. Yeah, and, I, and, and by the way, if Cole Will is saying that, and Cole Will is a physical presence, like they they must have some battles in training. I I, I can only imagine how the you know some of our 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 larger profiled center backs are dealing with a larger profiled attacker. I think I think that'd be fun to watch on a on a training cam or something. I have some stats, which I think will kind of help with Broya as well. Nick, as you're talking about it, he only had the one shot on target. I'm assuming they're calling that a shot, uh, and he had a goal. But he his dribble attempts, he was three for four as a big man. Mm -hmm. Ground duels won five of seven, and aerial duels won two of three. Now, my man lost possession nine times. That happens when you're an isolated forward. But to have all of that other uh, ability to win and maintain possession, winning the second ball in the Premier League is literally what David Moyes built his career on. Lump it forward, rush in behind, win the second ball, and we're off. Broya is going to offer that to your point. It's something that Nico Jackson needs to work on. He's good at a lot of other things, but we're okay there. But I did just want to point that out because... Broya, he's got a lot going on to him, and he looks confident. There doesn't seem to be any bit of concern coming off this injury. We know we've seen that with Ruben and Callum with their Achilles. Uh, so far, so good with Broya, and they were trying to wait and hold him back as much as possible. We were talking with Ali Glanville about this to make sure that he's kind of like beyond that statistical range of re-injuring himself. And if we've passed that and everything's good, like well done to the club, well done to Breuer for doing the work. I'm excited to see more of him. Uh, just lastly, real quick to touch on, Matson could have had a third. Leno with some oh, saves. Um, God, but that Matson that that shot. Again. The Matson shot would have been a phenomenal goal. I mean, they were talking about how much he opened his hip up to slice across that, Brandon. Like, you, you know how hard that is to do. Like, if that goes in the upper corner or the upper left-hand corner from there, pff, good night, nurse. That thing would have been beautiful. Look, that's a left back getting into creative places and being really dangerous, Dan. It's good to see Ian Matson get minutes. Minutes for Matson. Well, again, minutes for Matson and at a position where he's not playing a left back because he's just a wherever you need a jack of all trades he's just going to be the option we know he's de definitely not the first choice option second choice option fifth choice option probably at left back considering that mark kukurea is a right back and levi colwell continues to be the left back but again nitpicking on a match where chelsea win is not what we want to do but again good to see matza being evolved i i do think figuring out what his role is what his contribution can be mm -hmm. between now and january thinking about what happened, how close he was to a sale. The contract situation might be something to concern ourselves with, but we'll save that for a Matt pod. We'll save that for a NAS pod. But in general, good cameo performance for the second half. Last note, I need Enzo to put a couple balls in the back of the net when he has the opportunity. I mean, he's had a few in recent weeks that a player of his caliber needs to figure out how to finish, especially after a deflected shot. Like, don't hit it straight at the goalkeeper's face, man. Like, that, it's a tough beat.
it's it's ideal. So we'll we'll touch on that a little bit, but we're gonna take our last ad break. When we get back, uh, we'll far more to talk about. We're having fun. Let's keep the party going. Thank you to the sponsors. We'll be right back. All right, Captain Connor Gallagher. Can I get W's in the chat? What's up, my man? It's gonna be awkward though. I was thinking about this. Not to be annoying, Dan. He's playing in an attacking spot. And Kunku comes back. Chuck Omega comes back. Mainly in Kunku might have a bit of a, a situation on our hands because if Connor's gonna run out as captain for four, five, six, twelve matches, you can't just bench him all of a sudden. Well, you also imagine Reese James comes back healthy at some point and he'll take the arm band back. I know. Uh, fingers crossed, uh, knock on wood, whatever it is, throw salt over your shoulder. Like, Reese James needs to be healthy to take the camp- captain's armband. Ben Chilo needs to be healthy to take the captain's armband back. But at least today in the moment, Connor Gallagher, captain-level performance for Chelsea. You know, he was the official man of the match. I think he was my man of the match in terms of how much he contributed across the entirety of the game. And it looked like better things happened when he played further forward and Enzo and Caicedo dropped back. I know it's crazy, Nick. No. I know I'm talking <laughs> of madness, but it worked. Yeah, it did. I mean, Connor was fucking awesome today. I mean, he really was. I've seen a lot of uh, Connor Gallagher slander from some of the bigger Twitter accounts in recent weeks. Uh, you know who you are. Uh, this is such an important game for him. Um, one, because I think, you know, it it really ended up playing to me like he was an eight, Enzo was kind of an eight, and Caicedo was more of the deep-lying six in this. That's kind of how it shook out to me with the way that they were playing. But his his interchange with Cole Palmer was telepathic at times. And even going forward with with Kukurea, who is a a left-footed player, uh, playing in the right back spot. So those angles aren't necessarily great, you know, going out to Gallagher or, go, you know, going all the way forward to Palmer. Like, I think some of the interchange was super, super smart. Um, and I and I really enjoyed watching it. You know, Frank Lampard waxed poetic about him on the post-match coverage on Sky Sports. And I, you know, again, that's Frank Lampard's a guy who knows what it's like to train to be at an elite level the way he talked about Connor was that he had that same sort of will. You know, it remains to be seen if he has that sort of skill, the Lampard sort of skill. I mean, that's a once in a generation type of skill. But, I mean, off the ball runs, 28. That's just that's just sacrificing yourself for the betterment of the team, right? 12 kilometers covered. You know, these, these duels won. That's not a, just an offensive player to win 8 of 13 duels, Brandon. I mean, this is a guy who put in a complete shift today. What more do people want? I mean, Goals, yeah, I get that. But like it. he's doing everything inside a team that is not scoring goals until today. So you have to look and say, what else is going right for this team? And he was the bright light every single week. It wasn't that long ago that he ran out and got straight red early in the season last year and fought back through the adversity and has now won over what his fifth, sixth manager? Four, fourth, Seventeenth fourth. manager. <laughs> <laughs> Why stop counting at this point? It's everywhere. Everywhere he goes, West Brom, Palace, Chelsea, he gets selected. England. He's, he's now, yes, that's where he's gonna go with it. He's now regularly being picked for England. Connor Gallagher is filling in anywhere we need and doing a job. He's not the, he's not the place you got problems with this Chelsea squad. That is fine. I do too, but it's not Connor Gallagher. That's all I got to say. And I think more than that too, like, you know, most possession one in the final third, that is a, that's a Chelsea team that's trying to win the ball higher and to convert quick chances, right? Crash the ball. Don't let the defense get set and, and, play an easy ball so we get an easy shot on target. What a novel concept for us instead of trying to walk it in the back of the net through 18 people, right? Like those things, those little intricacies that you, you know, would typically attribute to someone like an N'Golo Conte, for example, he's doing and then making a really great pass out to Cole Palmer or, or into Broya, right? Like Dan, to me, like this is a guy that 
has he has he always done perfectly in every game? No. Am I am I trying to inflate this one performance to be who he is as a total Absolutely. player? No. You are. Okay, I love it. Uh but like come on, man. Like these are that's match winning stuff that just happened today. He's a he's the guy. Like he is the guy at the moment when Pochettino's looking for somebody to play forward, hold the team accountable, try to get results, who is answering the call. He wasn't, I think, anybody's on anybody's list as a one, two, third choice captain for this club. I think people would have said Tiago Silva, Enzo Fernandez, maybe a couple of others would have potentially risen above Connor in consideration, but he's just showing consistently when called upon, when asked to do something, he is capable of offering that to his fellow players on the pitch and to the managers who continue to choose to select him. It's simply that, that that is all it is, is execution is expected and is, a, it is able to be booked against for Connor, which is a nice thing. I tell you what, more Connor in my life. Keep it going. I, I just want to see it. And the fact that he's been at the club for so long and captain, uh, while the captain and vice captain are out with Tiago Silva on the on the pitch, other internationals, like he's just trusted, right? And good for him. I can't imagine anyone, you know, having it out for him right now. But we saw it with Mason, right? We're seeing it again. Like there's just a part of this supporters faction out there that dig in on this stuff and it's just unnecessary. So hopefully you guys can uh, take a break for a week and see how we can do because uh, Connor was good. He wasn't the only one though today, right? Um, Dan, it's funny. You called him Levi, not a left back Colwell. I just want to touch on this real quick. Yeah. Do you think, because I've been like, man, we're not at our best with Levi's left back. Do you think that Pochettino has a plan and it, the more times you do it and the more minutes you get, it starts to develop? Or is this a fluke? I don't think it's a fluke, but I think it's a... It is the byproduct of the situation of fitness. That Ben Chilwell is not available, that Mikhailo Mudrik was not at the... at to the races at the beginning of the season the way that he needed to be, which forced Chilwell off top and Levi into, a, you know, from center back into left back. You know, we have had Disasi playing right back. Like, there's just a lot of makeshift stuff for the second best defense in the Premier League. Again, remember who we played, and that that should actually be first. But you know, who's who's kind of putting that under a microscope right now? But Levi Colwell on the left in this match. Again, Fulham didn't do a whole lot to make his life difficult. But the passes he was playing forward, the runs he was making forward, he was given license to run like up and into or near the box at times, Nick. And this is with a team who had let, you know, did not possess the maximum amount of the ball that we could have. We found ourselves in a position by actually taking less, creating passing lanes for ourselves. We're actually having an easier time breaking down and breaking through opponents by saying, you know, we're not going to be so possession focused that we're actually going to allow ourselves to absorb pressure, break it off and move forward in advance. And Levi is a part of how quickly we can make those moves out of defense into attack. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's an interesting one, right? Because I think on the one side, Part of his advantage is, is what you and Sam talked about in the preview, which is he adds, you know, by playing Levi Colwell at left back, it's a relatively short team, right? Like this isn't like the biggest team in the world. It gives you that extra height on set pieces and it gives you cover for Tiago Silva, right? On the other side, though, what he's really fucking good at is passing the football. <laughs> and we want him to pass the football more into dangerous areas because if that ball to Mudrik is any example of what he can do on the fly, right? That wasn't a, a set piece or anything. That was him flying down the wing and making an inch-perfect pass. It's it's the risk-reward scenario to me, Brandon. Like, how do you, how do you weigh getting that uh, incredibly gifted player up and down the pitch when this is not his natural position and conditioning for this role, as we saw in preseason is crazy hard. I mean, the fullbacks are under so much strain. 
Yeah, with the out about they are. Um, and we got a little glimpse of him, right, at left center back, and you're like, oh, yeah, his distribution from back here is fantastic. That was fun. Um, the the cross, it was so hard to wait that. But, um, look, time will tell. We are being forced in these things. I, though, still think that Potch is going to try to make this work from a defensive set-piece standpoint, um, and we'll have to see. Caicedo looks fit. A fit Caicedo looks good. All of a sudden, $115 million feels a lot better in this side. I think his... I remember... You guys remember his debut match when he was literally like tripping over the ball? I mean, he was not ready. He didn't have a preseason. He was away from the team. And now he's had some weeks, played some international football we are now starting to see the player that Chelsea bought again, right? It was hard to see it, you know, in some weeks and the consistency. Uh, I think today was a great day to really cement that, Dan. And I think what it brings to the table um, is confidence. When Enzo is playing well, the team has confidence. When Caicedo is playing well, the team will have confidence. And uh, he's like N'Golo Conte. If he's on his A game, everyone else will play better because they know um, he's going to lock it down and take care of everything. Yeah, when you look at the the location of where Kaizeda was, it was a bright red heat map just you know in between the center of the pitch and the front of the defense, and he made it extremely difficult for Fulham's attack to get anything going uh, down that side of the pitch. I mean, ultimately, I think William ran him into a place of exhaustion near the end of the game there, which again, still everybody getting back to the fitness. Let's be as precautionary as possible. Let's not put people in the situations where they are beyond their load and get these soft tissue injuries. Like let's yank them early, get them off, get them rest. But overall, a really great performance from him. And I think exciting to see this idea that these three can play together because everybody's like, Oh, it's just two. It's two. It's midfield two. And now we're, We've opened up. We've allowed ourselves to believe in this idea, Nick, of a midfield three. I I love a midfield three <laughs> personally. I don't know. I don't know who who is in charge of that. I think Nkunku may shift that again at some point when he comes back. But that's another problem for January or whatever. Um, here's how you know that he was really good today, and this is like a really simple eye test. Enzo and Gallagher had so much space and time on the ball once he passed it to him because he was winning it in kind of forward areas. And because he was kind of playing that deeper anchor role, his distribution is excellent. I mean, we saw he was like a 91% passing percentage all last year. Like he just doesn't misplace passes that often. Enzo got the ball with space instead of being immediately collapsed upon because we were winning the ball back. Gallagher was able to run with the ball forward. There was an excellent uh, hockey assist out to, out to Colwell. I mean, I, the words in Golo Conte should not kind of come out of anyone's mouth until we see a larger body of work uh, is, is my take on it. Cause he's just simply my, my favorite player ever, but it was an excellent display. And, the fact that Deserby is is now talking about him in every press conference. Oh, mwah. keep my midfielder's name out of <laughs> my mother <laughs> effing mouth. <laughs> Just, oh, I mean, he's really, really good. Of course, he's going to be good. Period. So, eighty nine percent pass accuracy, four for four long balls, right? Creating mm-hmm. some space. Um, two for three dribble attempts. Seven for ten ground duels. One. Uh, did not win his one aerial duel. Um, he had a block shot, an interception, and three tackles and was never dribbled a path, past. So, again, um, Swiss Army Knife does a lot of different things. We're off there. Lastly, Dan, you call him Bob. The rest of the world calls him Mr. Sanchez out of respect. Bob he is now, a sign of respect. Thank you very much. He now... Has the most clean sheets in the Premier League. He now starting to look like a steal from Brighton for the money that we paid. 
you know, one man's trash is another man's treasure is a bit of a harsh statement, and I'm not going to use it in this case, but I'm just saying, Nick, I am a lot happier with today's display. We all saw in the League Cup how his feet got him into trouble, but when the team in front of him plays better, he can play better. And uh, he's he is giving me confidence. He's a brick by brick guy right now. One game at a time, get to the next. Nothing fatal has happened. I have no serious complaints with him right now. The, the distribution of the feed. I mean, he almost gave up a goal from, you know, kicking it out, right? So, For sure. I mean, I think, I think these are really important things to kind of denote in the clean sheet that, you know, we got lucky, he got it back, and then he made a really great save later in the game. That for me kind of like makes up for the silly error, but he's been great at coming to claim the ball, right? Uh, he has shown, I think, confidence specifically past the West Ham game and the way that he's able to kind of control his area. I don't think he's given up a howler or anything like that to this point. And you know, again, like the defense is playing fine. He's a part of that. The defense is is good enough, I think, for us to be in the in the top six race. He's he's not a goal scorer. He's not where my eye is being drawn right now in terms of you know where the team needs to overperform in the next handful of weeks. So, you know, it, he'll either be Robert or Bob, depending on on what type of performance we get. Uh, but, you know. I, I do. I, I side with Dan on the Bob is a sign of respect. It, it is. It is. I, I mean, look, great that he is locking down a starting position in the Premier League at the moment. Like, best situation we could have hoped for is that he is being the better version of the player who got benched last season for Steel. Like, this is this is a good this is a good problem. All right, we don't need to to bag on too long. I just wanted to point that out. Uh, you know, been doing doing all right as long as you don't have to play out of the back uh, through him. So, Dan of the match because it's a win. Sing the praises. Look, I gave the people three options, and then I let them have the other option because I felt like there were more than four. And again. Now that it's gone from Twitter X, I still can't give you more than four options. That's just the limitation of the platform. Connor Gallagher wins with 55% of the vote. It was Moises Caicedo in second place with 24%. Mikhailo Mudrik with almost 14%. And then other at 75 Plenty of shouts for Cole Palmer. Plenty of shouts for Levi Colwell. One Brandon Busby mentioning Bob. Why not Sanchez? Justice for Robert. Look, there were there were people like again on a day where there's a win, there's a lot of praise for people. I'm sorry, that's just the way it works. Don't we have a ver a paid account? You couldn't <clears throat> fix Madurki. No, you can't. You can't edit. <laughs> of course, you can't. Yeah. You can't edit the poll options. You could edit the tweet. I can't oh. wait for Thanksgiving. You know. Yeah. I got, I, oh my gosh, Madurki, Madurki, <laughs> Mudrik, unlucky, teach Siri what's up. Uh, we have like look, 200 votes in, in like two minutes. I can go back and, and make a new poll. That's dumb. I hear you, but 55% for someone who didn't score a goal today just shows you uh, the respect he has, which is impressive. So um, yeah, good, good for him. Uh, real quick, uh, other results from around the league. Villa smashing Brighton. Arsenal smashing Bournemouth. Luton getting their first ever Premier League win against Sean Dyche's soon-to-be-relegated Everton. Uh, United losing to Ro uh, Roy Hodgson's Crystal Palace. one nothing. Newcastle slipping by Burnley 2-0. West Ham 2. Sheffield United 0. Wolves beat Man City 2-1, which probably ruined a lot of bets on the weekend. Uh, the Tottenham-Liverpool drama. Liverpool having two players sent off, losing to Tottenham 2-1. to one. Uh, And then Forrest, Brentford 1-1 one, one with Chelsea-Fulham, the Monday match. So as it stands, as Dan said, I can't remember if it was on the pot or off, but it feels good to be in 11th, but not good enough. We have more work to do as Man City, Tottenham, Arsenal, Liverpool are in the top four with Bournemouth, Burnley, and Sheffield in the bottom three. Gentlemen, it's been fun. 
Monday night. Anytime we get to record on a win is fun. I promise we'll be back with more content. I saw that Chelsea have to play Burnley next. Uh, Back to Saturday morning kickoff at the proper 3 p.m. UK time. Looking forward to that. Back to normalcy, which would be good. Um, Want to absolutely just smash them up. I believe it's at uh, Burnley. So a bit of a trip. One of our friends in the UK said, if it takes more than one train to get there, it ain't worth going. So hopefully the traveling fans make it up there. (laughs) Okay. Anyways, that's going to wrap us up. A ton more content coming at you always because we love what we do and we know you as fans love it as well. So anyways, that's going to wrap us up. Until next time, Chelsea fans, you know what to do. Keep the blue flag flying high.